Thank you very much for the introduction. It's my great pleasure to be here today and present to you my joint work with Benny, Ili, and Pratyay about continuous space-bound at non-mobile codes. OK, so let me begin with a short motivation. Imagine that you have a small memory device that performs some cryptographic functionality. Uh, so that means that uh, some secret key is stored in the memory of this device. So on this example, you can see digital signatures and the security property of digital signatures guarantee that no one can forge a signature. Okay, but what happens if now an adversary can tamper with the memory of this device? So it changes the secret key to some tampered secret key prime. It turns out that in this case, some information about the secret key can be leaked and even enough information to recover this entire secret key. So the unfortunability would be completely broken in this case. So what can we do about it? And we are in the session of non-mobile code, so we're gonna, uh, one way how to protect against memory tempering is using a non-mobile code. For this example, for space-bounded tempering. So roughly what would happen here, instead of storing the secret key on the memory of the device, we would store an encoding of this secret key. And as you had heard from the previous speakers, the property, the non-malleability property would guarantee that even if someone tempers now with the memory, no information is leaked about the original secret. Okay, so uh, space-bounded tempering was first time considered uh, in a paper that was presented here in, at Crypto two years ago. And what, what is actually space-bounded tempering? We restrict the tempering function just by the resources of the device. More specifically, we say that the space complexity of the tempering function and the space complexity of the decoding algorithm are bounded by the memory of the device. And uh, this actually implies that the tempering function can decode. And it's not so difficult to see that in this case, full non-malleability is actually impossible to achieve. So to this end, a definition of uh, leaky non-malleability was introduced, where it's allowed for the tempering to leak some small part of the input, just a small part. And for many applications, this is completely fine. For example, for uh, leaky uh, resilient signatures. Okay, so the prior work uh, introduced a generic construction, generic space-bounded non-malleable code, and it was based on non-interactive proof of space. That was the main building block. However, it had one limitation, namely that the size of leakage was growing linearly in the number of tempering rounds. And this implies that tempering is a priori bounded. Why is this? Well, we leak every time. For every tempering round, we have some leakage. So eventually, we would leak the entire secret key. So the protection given by the non malleable code would be completely meaningless. And what was left as an open question is to achieve an unbounded polynomial, unbounded tempering. And this is exactly what we focused on in our paper and what I will be talking about today. Okay, so our goal is to have a space-bounded non mobile code for unbounded tempering. And we actually looked at the generic code construction from the prior work and we kept the construction as it was, but we instantiated it with a stronger building block. In particular, we defined something we call proof extractability of proof of space. And we showed two different approaches how to construct such a proof of space. And we end up with several constructions that have different parameters, but I will tell you more about that in my talk. Okay, so before I get to the code construction, let me be a little bit more precise about what leaky non mobile codes are. It's not a formal uh, definition, but just to give a high-level idea. Okay, so we have a coding scheme that consists of encoding and decoding algorithm. And consider a polynomial time algorithm, polynomial time adversary, that is space unbounded. Okay, so we have no restrictions on space. And it can prepare a tempering function that can be arbitrary but space-bounded. And this tempering function now tempers with a target code word C and tempers to a code word C1. The adversary then learns the result of decoding of C1. And we say that our coding scheme is L-leak and non malleable if there exists a simulator that can simulate this tempering experiment 
uh, without knowing the original secret, but getting a small hint. Okay, so it can get L bits of leakage and then it has to simulate the tempering experiment. This definition can be uh, generalized for repeated tempering. So after the first round of tempering, as you saw on the previous slide, the adversary is allowed to pick another tempering function, which now tempers with this C1 to C2, and again, adversary learns the result of decoding of C2. Okay, so now we are prepared to have a look at the non-mobile code construction. So, as I said before, uh, it's based on non-interactive proof of space. So, non-interactive proof of space is a, a primitive between two parties. So, we have a prover and a verifier. And prover has a lot of memory. And it wants to convince a space-bounded verifier about this fact. So, what he, do, uh, what he does, he takes some unique identity, it generates a proof, and this generation requires a lot of space and sends over the identity and the proof to a verifier. And the verifier is able to verify that uh, this is a valid pair. So that was just on very high level. And the code construction is now very simple. If we want to encode a message M, we just run the proof algorithm of the proof of space. We generate a proof. And our code word consists of the message in plain and the proof attached to it. The decoding, well, we first parse the code word into a message and a proof, we run the verification algorithm, which does not require a lot of space, right? That's the property that we get from the proof of space. And if everything is fine, we output a message M, otherwise we get an invalid code word. Okay, so before I show you why this is a leaky non-mobile code and why we actually have bounded tempering in this case, we need to have a little bit closer look at the building block, at the non-interactive proof of space or NIPOS for short. In particular, let's have a look at the soundness property or the, the property that guarantees that prover cannot cheat. So if the prover does not have enough space, he should not be able to convince the verifier, right? So how do we formalize this? It's an experiment or a game. And we again have a polynomial time space unbounded adversary that can run some arbitrary pre-computation. So for example, prepare some identity proof pairs. And uh, the adversary now prepares a space bounded tempering function that tempers with the target identity and a proof. And now if the result of tempering is actually a valid pair, then the extractability tells us that this ID tilde is either the original identity or one of the pre-computed values, in which case we are able to extract from the pre-computation this ID tilde. So given a short hint, we are able to extract ID tilde. Or said differently, space-bounded algorithm cannot generate a valid proof for a new ID. Okay, so let's have a look at the code construction, why it's actually leaky non malleable So just a sketch of how a simulator works. There are many technical details missing, but just to give a high-level idea. So the simulator gets the first tempering function, and it asks a leakage oracle for a short hint. And by extractability, given this short hint, it's able to extract the identity, so it's able to extract this SK1. And now for the next round of tempering, well, it does exactly the same. It again asks for a hint, the leakage oracle simulates the tempering, depending on the result, returns back a hint. We extract SK2 and so on and so forth. So as you can see, for every tempering round, every tempering, we need one leakage query. And this is exactly why uh, we don't achieve unbounded tempering. So this is the problem in the prior work. So can we do better? And the answer is yes, and it lies in stronger proof of space. So what do I mean by that? In particular, in our paper, we define a notion of proof extractability. And as the name suggests, we don't want to extract only the identity, but also a proof. Okay, and that's exactly what's happening here. Instead of extracting only identity, ID tilde, we also want pi tilde. Or if you look at it differently, we want to say that a space-bounded algorithm, algorithm cannot generate a new valid proof. 
not even for old IDs, okay? So the code to instruction is exactly the same as in the prior work, but we have proof extractable, non-interactive proof of space. And this helps, and this helps, and let me uh, show you how. So the first round of tempering, the simulator gets the tempering algorithm, again asks the leakage oracle to simulate the tempering experiment inside and return back a hint. Given this hint, we are able to extract identity and a proof, which means we have the entire code word C1. So fine, the first round we managed to simulate, but that was the same as in the prior work as well. But now comes the difference. When we get the second tempering algorithm, now we don't have to ask a leakage query anymore. We have the C1. We can just simulate the tempering experiment without further leakage. And that's exactly what we wanted. So as you can see, the number of leakage queries is now independent of the number of tempering rounds. Okay, so the big question here is now, okay, how can we, ex uh, how can we construct proof extractable NIPOS? And in our paper, we consider two different approaches. And I will tell you a little bit about each of them. I can unfortunately not go in detail, but just to have, give you an idea. So let me start with the uniqueness approach. So we say that NIPO satisfies U uniqueness if a valid proof, like if the identity defines uniquely U bits of a valid proof. Okay, so U bits are uniquely defined, and the N minus U, the remaining bits, we don't know. And it's not so difficult to see that extractability and uniqueness together actually imply proof extractability. So what's the main idea behind it? So if the result of tempering this ID tilde pi tilde is actually a valid pair, then by extractability, we are able to extract this ID tilde. So ID tilde we have, so now the question is how do we get pi tilde? By uniqueness, or U uniqueness, we know the U bits of the proof. So, but we still don't know N minus U bits. So in other words, if we get as a hint, the hint that we need for extractability plus the unknown bits, we are able to extract entire identity and a proof. So obviously our goal here is to come up with a non-interactive proof of space this, that satisfies as high uniqueness as possible. Okay, full uniqueness would be ideal, but we want to achieve as high as possible. So first of all, we looked at the prior work and saw that the non-interactive proof of space had zero uniqueness. So technically, yes, we do get a proof extractable NIPOS, but with very bad parameters. So we also considered a heuristic construction based on uh, memory hard functions. So let me give an, a rough idea how our proof algorithm actually works. So on input the identity, we first hash this identity and then evaluate a memory hard function. That's a function that requires a lot of space to compute. So this would be fine. We have uh, memory hardness, so it's, uh, the prover has to use a lot of space, but we don't have the efficient verification. So to this end, we actually run a verifiable computation to produce a very short proof that the computation was done correctly. So that's the high level idea. We get a partially unique uh, NIPOS. Uh, the details I refer to the paper, but I want to point out why did I say heuristic? Where is the problem here with this construction? And it lies in the memory hard function because we have memory hard functions in the random oracle model or in other idealized models. But in order to run verifiable computation, we would need to instantiate the random oracle with a concrete hash function. So that's why this construction is just a heuristic. Okay, so let's have a look at the other approach, how to construct proof extractable non-interactive proof of space, in particular from challenge hard graphs that we introduced in our paper. So here I have to also give a small warning. We have to slightly weaken our adversarial model, but in a realistic way, and I will show you in a few slides what this means or what I mean by this. So first of all, in order to explain challenge hard graphs, uh, let's 
consider a directed acyclic graph. Okay, so we have a directed acyclic graph and uh, we have a hash function h. So if we want to compute the h labeling of such a graph, we want to assign a label to each node. And we do it, as you can see on the picture, for example, this black node. If we want to compute the label, where we look at the labels of all the children of this node, and we hash it together. OK, so now we are prepared to actually explain what uh, challenge hard graphs are. So we consider a directed acyclic graph, and we divide the things of this graph in several sets. We call them target sets. So in the picture, there are just two, but uh, yeah. Uh, we randomly select one challenge node from each target set, and we say that a space-bounded algorithm can label all the challenged nodes, or all the challenge nodes, only with negligible probability. Okay, so space-bounded algorithm, it's very hard to actually label all the challenge nodes. And uh, this should hold even if some of the labels are given for free to the space-bounded algorithm. Not all, but some. OK, so how does this help us to get proof extractability? Uh, high level overview of the construction details are again omitted. So we have a hash function h that depends on the input identity. And we first of all compute a labeling of our challenge hard graph. Then we use a Merkle tree to commit to this labeling and we hash the root to generate randomness and define two sets of nodes. First set is so-called check nodes, and the purpose of these check nodes is to verify that actually the labeling was done correctly. So we open, uh, we provide the opening path for this node and its children, and we check that the local correctness of the labeling. The second set is the challenge node, so one node from each target set, and this is for, the, for guaranteeing that it was memory hard or that it was space uh, exhausting to do this computation. So why is this proof extractable? Just the main idea. Well, either the adversary pre-computes the entire labeling and the Merkle tree, so everything was pre-computed, and in this case, we are able to extract id tilde and pi tilde from the pre-computation. Or the adversary did not do everything. In particular, he did not compute the root and did not hash the root, so he did not know the challenge nodes. And in this case, we use the challenge hardness to say that the tempering algorithm has a negligible success probability to answer all the challenges correctly. Okay, and here it's actually important that the uh, tempering algorithm has a bounded description. And if we go back to the application that I showed you at the very beginning, assuming that the description of this tempering function can be absolutely arbitrary, might seem to be a bit of an overkill. So requiring that the mm -hmm. description of the algorithm is bounded is not such an re unrealistic assumption. OK, so what remains to discuss is how do we get challenge hard graphs? What are they? How do we get them? So first of all, we looked at stack of uh, localized expander graphs from Ren and Devadas from 2016. And uh, we extended the construction to achieve nice parameters for challenge hard graphs. Uh, so high level idea of the construction, we group the sinks of the SOLEC, of the stack of lo localized ex ex expander graph, and we put a gadget graph on top of each group. You can see on the picture how each gadget uh, graph looks. It has several lines. And how do we now connect this gadget graph to our sinks? Well, we take the first sink and connect it to the first node in each line. We take the second sink and connect it to the second node in each line, and so on and so forth, okay? So uh, we also evaluated a graph construction uh, given by Paul and then later used by Jambowski et al. in their proof of space construction. And actually, it shows that they also satisfy challenge hardness. In fact, with better asymptotic parameters than the extension of SOLEX. 
However, the constants are large. So if we evaluate uh, for concrete security, uh, the extension of Solex performs way better. Okay, so we have, we, uh, I discussed now four different constructions for proof extractable non-interactive proof of space, which gives us four different constructions for our non-mobile code. So let me conclude my talk with a small overview. So what we wanted to do was generic space-bounded non-mobile code construction for unbounded tempering. And what we did, we took the construction from prior work, but instantiated it with proof extractable non-interactive proof of space. And as you saw on the previous slide, there were four different construction with different advantages and disadvantages. Here you can see an overview. In the paper, you can see both asymptotic and concrete parameters and a more detailed overview. Here is just to give you an idea how practical or impractical constructions are. So if you look at the first line, the pri which represents the prior work, we are in order of terabytes. It's not very practical. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at our uh, memory hard uh, function-based construction, we are in order of kilobytes. So, so the gap is huge. And somewhere in between, we have the challenge hard graph constructions. And here you can also see that the SOLEC based one outperforms the original uh, construction from uh, pr the proof of space paper. OK, and what we leave as an open question for, for or as a future work uh, to design a fully unique non-interactive proof of space, because that would lead to a memory uh, to a non mobile code with very nice parameters. OK, so that's everything. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions? Hey. Hello. Uh, in continuous non malleable codes, usually there is this problem of self destruct. Yes. Meaning that uh, as soon as you get an error, you should stop. Yes. But it seems that uh, you never mention it. In your yeah, uh, I did not mention it, but yes, we do need self destruct. Okay. You need that essentially always for continuous okay. non malleable so, codes. Uh, yes, we do need self destruct. When you said the uh, bound, you bound the size of the, uh, the adversary. What, what is this like by a constant, or uh, is it something, some sort of parameter? No, I mean, I mean, all the parameters depend on each other, so it's a parameter, okay. Okay. and of course you have to uh, link to the remaining but is, one. But uh, how much is the relative size? Uh, well, it depends on the so oh. it depends on concrete, like which of the constructions you take. Okay. So we can talk about uh, details later off offline. Okay, thank you again.